Okay, yes, thank you everyone who uh, has joined us so far. Um, my name is Simon Clark. I'm EGU's programs coordinator and welcome to this webinar, how to visualize your research using scientific accessible graphics. Um, you'll be learning how to visualize results in a manner that is true to data, how to emphasize the readability of your results, including how to make them accessible. The webinar itself will last approximately 45 minutes with a Q&A session at the end. If you have a question, please type it in in our Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, where you can also upvote questions you think should be answered. So to take us on our journey today is Fabio Crameri, who is a freelance researcher and graphic designer of science-related content. And this includes producing scientific color maps for data true and inclusive visualization. So uh, welcome Fabio, uh, would you like to begin? Thank you, Simon, yes. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I hope you're all ready, so this is gonna be a lot. Um, un unfortunately, one webinar is not enough to tell you everything about um, graphic design. As you know, uh, graphic design is, is a scientific discipline on its own, like geosciences. Um, but since we as geoscientists are uh, no experts in graphic design, I thought it would be good to just cover the basics of graphic, de graphic design. So what I will talk about is um, uh, try to explain how to create effective graphics that um, excel your research, um, how to make them scientifically accurate so that they don't distort the underlying data, and how to make them accessible to all your peers and, and the viewers in general. Um, most of the information you also find on my webpage, fabricramery.ch. And then um, I think we're ready to just dive in. And I would like, of course, to start this webinar with a graphic. Uh, you've all seen this and you all uh, know what it means. Uh, even though it's simple, it can communicate a lot. Um, so does this one here in quite the opposite manner. Um, and this one as well, this one as well. So visualization is really powerful. Um, if we would show this one or this one, this wouldn't work in this quite the same manner. Um, so this is because it has been done right. It was either too complex or too simple. So visualization really must be done right. And visualization must also be accessible to everyone. So if you couldn't read the text to the left and the right because it was too small, um, for example, then visualization um, has failed and your figure might have failed as well. Um, so yeah, visualization and graphics like the heart are, are super powerful um, since they uh, can span generations and cultures. Um, you only need to think of the emojis, which really has become a global language now. And it's all graphics basically. Um, also for science, this is quite important because without um, nice figures, um, you won't see good science either. And this is especially true today where um, research has become an everyday competition for everyone's attention. So, so many papers um, are published these days that we often don't have time to read all of the papers we would like to read. So what we do is just read the title and look at the figures mostly. And if the figures aren't conveying your message, then you, you often lose um, your readership already. So know um, the importance of graphic design, know the basics, and also know when you need professional help. Um, as I said, visualization is, is probably one of the most widely used scientific methodologies we use in research, uh, which is great, but at the same time, it's also probably the least widely taught one, which is a huge shortcoming. So um, throughout my whole education as a geoscientist, I never had one single class teaching me how to make figures and, or just the basics about um, graphic design. So we really are not experts here. This is why I give this seminar. And um, this is a short overview of what I will talk about. So first I will start to explain you the different flavors of figures. Um, there's a difference between 
uh, individual figures, then show you um, key visualization pitfalls that we have to avoid, and then give an overview of all the visual visualization tools, images, typefaces, and so on. And then end up by giving you or trying to give you a simple recipe on how to make a good figure. So um, there are different flavors of figures. And for scientific figures, these are mainly artistic impressions, conceptual illustrations, and data visualizations. And they have all um, different aspects that we need to get right to, in order to make them work. So artistic impressions uh, basically represent a fixture's view on uh, a scientific concept. Like here, uh, as shown on the right-hand side, this is a simple representation of the Earth. Not everything is perfectly represented, but it gives you an idea of how something might look like um, if it were the case that we would extract some pieces of the Earth in this example. Then we have conceptual illustrations, like this example here about ocean plate tectonics. Um, these are mainly freehand drawings, not always freehand, but um, drawings that can portray a certain concept qualitatively. So here um, we highlight the oceanic plate as it is dragged down by its sinking plate portions by the slab pull. And um, it gets formed in some places on the surface, then cools and then gets destructed in another place. So this can kind of convey this concept of ocean plate tectonics very nicely. And finally, there is data visualizations, uh, also very often used um, graphic. Um, these are basically database maps or charts or graphs um, that really quantify now the data. And uh, they do it by relating the underlying data via graphical rulers or um, um, scales. So here, um, this is really key that the mapping of the data um, is correctly done. Um, since there is not really one single way of making a, a, a good graphic, um, it's important that we just don't make any major mistakes. So preventing pitfalls is kind of key. Um, I guess most of you know some visualization pitfalls. So if you think about what could be uh, some pitfalls you might have some in your head. Um, these are some I could come up with. Um, for example, perceptionally non-uniform color maps that distort the underlying data, um, which are actually also faulty scales, and then faulty scales in general, inaccessible color coding, um, color coding that is not readable by some people because of, for example, red and green combinations. Uh, no scales at all is a common one as well, even though we as geoscientists um, have been hammered uh, in that we should use a hammer or a coin when you take pictures um, close to rocks just to uh, get the scales right. And then in general inaccessible graphs like 3D pie plots, for example, which I'll come back to. Um, unreadable annotations if the text is too small and not readable if the figure in general is overloaded, if people try to get in all kinds of information and end up basically communicating nothing at all, or if um, the graphic designer fails to really reach the audience. Um, and then finally, uh, also what often happens is that people start, um, miss to, to give the acknowledgement to uh, things they reuse in their figures. Um, all these can be grouped into kind of critical pitfalls and also uh, pitfalls that are not critical per se, but should be avoided. Uh, but the critical ones on top, they, we really have to avoid them, um, even though that is currently widely not the case. So just to highlight a few of those, so misleading graph types would be a 3D pie chart can be really misleading. Um, here you see Steve Jobs during an Apple keynote, and he actually knows about uh, the flaws of this graphic design, and he uses it to his advantage. So he shows the Apple share on the green um, green pie piece that is closest to you, which looks much larger due to the visual distortion than, for example, the purple one in the back. 
even though factually it's smaller. Um, this is because uh, pie charts are difficult for us because we cannot um, compare angles easily. And also the 3D view, of course, uh, makes things look bigger uh, the closer they are to you. So we can't use that in science. Another example is bar plots without the zero baseline. Um, this is an example where you, uh, your intuition is that this data set increased a lot uh, during the past years, which is actually not the case. If you look at it in a proper uh, graphic, then you see that the entire data set basically didn't change at all. So you should always put a zero baseline for graph plots. Um, this is also used by politically inclined parties, um, like this one here, where basically they don't use a zero uh, baseline to just try and highlight that the uh, apprehension, border apprehension increased a lot during the last years, which was probably not the case. Uh, sometimes these go even further and actually kind of truly mislead the viewers um, here by just um, distorting scales. So at the bottom you have a difference of 30, on top you have a difference of 50. And this makes you know all these cases I think it was COVID cases, uh, look as if they are just gradually increasing instead of um, a much stronger increase. Um, they go even, even that far to make some data points look much lower than they actually are, but even further uh, squeezing the axis. Of course, in science, we can't do that as well. Um, however, we often do that as well in science. So. Uh, you all know rainbow color map. So here on the left hand side, you see a scientific version of the data. And um, it's basically a gradual increase towards the center with some uh, fluctuations. If you represent it with a full disk scales, like the one on the right hand side, you see all kinds of visual artifacts and the entire data set is misrepresented. So this shouldn't be used as well. And then finally, some inaccessible graphics. Um, if you have some line plots and color them with uh, like red, green, and blue, like on the right hand side, then this is hardly visible for many people. And also, when you turn it into a, a grayscale graph or for people with color blindness, then uh, this figure becomes unreadable. Because in this figure, what you need to have is the connection between the, the graph individual graphs and the data set uh, marked here as ABC. And if you have it separated like this and just connected via the color coding, then this can fail. So um, to create science graphics, we, we need to know our visualization tools. And there are a few of them, and I will now go through all of them. So these are images, typefaces, graphs, graph scale and axis, and reference frames, and then finally also colors. And then one more thing at the, at the end. So first up, images. Um, try to use high resolution ones. Um, if you use images that, they, that uh, are pre-existing, um, really check the licensing and cite the sources. Um, there is a lot of open source. Uh, open access images um, on the web. So useful sites are unsplash.com, pixabay.com, or for us, very relevant and useful is imageo.egu.eu, where you also can upload your own images. And then another tool is uh, typefaces, which probably most figures use as well. I'm um, here to remember is that typefaces have voice, so they, they also um, communicate something. So it's good to, to think about these as well. And then, of course, it matters whether you use a typeface for a title, for a paragraph, for digital or print, and also whether you want to choose clarity or readability. So in general, for figures, you would use sans serif fonts like Helvetica, uh, Arial, Futura, or Open Sans. Um, rather than serif fonts um, that you have seen at the bottom. And again, 
um, you have some pre-installed font um, typefaces on your uh, on your computer, but of course you can go to the internet and download um, more open fonts, for example, from Google, DaFont, or FontSquare. Here's an example figure where I used Open Sans. Um, I really like this one as well uh, because it's kind of clear. And this is just a, a subduction zone initiation event. And we represent um, the rocks that are placed on top uh, during this event. And then I used different fonts, um, bold and italic, uh, to, make, to make some of these uh, words pop out more. So I think it's a very clear font that can be used online as well. Another tool is, of course, the graphs that we uh, represent our data in. Um, here I just show you an example of all the MATLAB plots that are possible to create. Uh, in general, I would suggest to just go for the easier version rather than the more complicated ones and try to avoid the problems, for example, with the 3D pie charts. Um, if you're interested in more complicated and elaborated examples, um, it's xeno.graphics is a nice uh, web page uh, where you can see them, but this is really done by graphic design experts, so you, you really have to put in your effort to get these right as well. So keep it simple if you can. Um, I, I really like bar plots. I think they are simple and effective um, because they allow you to, to really quantify the differences between individual data sets. So you can really tell whether it's uh, one bar is half of the other or not, whether it's a bit less or a bit more. And um, if you do it like this, you can also show the total amount of events in this case um, versus the actual counts um, with the darker pink color indicated here. So they are easy to look at and, and uh, represent the data properly. Um, graph scales, they are used to make relative proportions accessible. Um, for example, the size of an object or the duration of a period. Um, so it's key to include them wherever you, you can. Um, there are is some examples where you don't need an actual scale on it. For example, if you show the Earth, um, I guess all of us know how, how, how wide it is. So this is kind of an implicit scale already. So in these cases, we don't need the scale. But uh, in most other cases, um, the size or the duration is, is really important to know. Um, so an important scale is also graph axis. Um, and they are used to uh, map data to a position. Um, if you have a position axis like x and y, or you, to a color if you have a color bar. And then also the dimension, they need to be uh, correctly represented. So people often uh, use abbreviations instead of um, dimensions, for example, for the, for the uh, variable year. Uh, people use YRS, which is not a proper um, dimension and can cause confusion. I actually wrote a whole blog post about it. If you're interested. Um, graph axes are really important um, as this example shows. So that's a geologic time scale. And often when we look at a uh, geologic time scale, um, these have squeezed um, axes just because we know much more about the more recent Earth, like since 800 million years or so, um, than we know about the Earth further back in time. And um, but representing it sometimes with a proper axis can really help us to 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 appreciate how much time has passed before then. And then, of course, we come up with um, names like the boring billion and so on. Uh, the reference frame is another important tool for each graphic. Uh, it's used to provide a perspective on the data. So this can be 2D versus 3D, um, it can be different map projections, or it can be the canvas where you put your figure on. Um, for the example of map projections, you have all seen the, all the different kinds, and sometimes 
um, if you don't know what they stand for, it, it can be a bit um, too much to, to uh, decide on one. So there's basically three different flavors of, of map projections. Um, there's an equal area map projection, um, which represents the area according to nature, and Molvide is an example of that. So if you want to show the distribution of something on the Earth's surface, you would probably choose Molvide for that, to not misrepresent your data. Then there's something called conformal projection, um, where the local shape is preserved, as for example in the Mercator projection. So if you really want to see um, how Iceland looks like geometrically um, accurately, then uh, you would probably use this map to do that. And finally, there's equidistant projections um, that preserve the distance across the map. So if you plan to travel from the north to the south pole, you probably would use a map like Cassini to really know how far you've come once you've reached Africa or something. So it's good to think about um, the map projection each time you represent a new um, data set. And then the canvas um, can be important. So in the middle, you see an original, original image on, on white canvas. Um, then if we often represent it on a dark background, so here it's, it's just black, and you can do that by just maintaining the colors on the left-hand side. Um, this, however, reduces the effectiveness of the figure because now you have the strongest contrast. Um, it's not the darker colors, but the light colors. It's because of the background um, you've chosen. And this is actually the most boring parts in this figure. Uh, what you want to do is, like on the right hand side, um, highlight you know, the features uh, with the colors. And you can do that by invert all colors. What you have to be careful with is just not to simply invert the colors because then you also change the hue, but make dark red to light red and light blue to dark blue and so on. And then color which is probably my favorite topic. Um, it is often used to make the figure content more accessible, but it's, it's really important to keep in mind that you should keep it to a minimum. And put it, um, if you put it differently, and as some other people uh, say this, uh, gray is your best friend in data visualization. So um, try to start with the figure in gray scale and then add color where it's really necessary. Here's just an, an example of a figure. This is actually a figure showing how to we perceive color. And here I found it necessary to color um, the light, the different wavelength of the light from the light source to the colored object um, in the respective colors, because you have the blue wavelength, the green wavelength, and the red wavelength. But now you have to be careful because um, some people cannot distinguish some of these colors, for example, green and red. So you have to make sure that your figure is also readable um, without the actual color coding. And I did this by just having uh, differently spaced uh, dashes for these lines, uh, which actually also represent the short wavelength and the long wavelength. So the figure content is still perfectly readable for all viewers. Um, now we can go even further and use more colors. Uh, here's again a, a, a geologic time scale, but this one is actually color vision deficiency friendly. So I use all the different um, discrete battle colors to color all the different times uh, in here. Now we can do simulations um, of how it might look like to some people. So this is Deuteranopia simulation for green blind people. Uh, this is Protanopia simulation for red blind people. This is Tritanopia for blue blindness. And then even for Achromatopsia, which is uh, nothing else than grayscale, uh, for color blind people, or if you print it in black and white, um, this is still uh, readable as is. 
Of course, the more color you use, the closer they become to each other and get harder to distinguish. But um, finally, you don't have uh, overlapping colors at all. So all these color palettes, of course, they are really difficult to create. So I provide them on my web page um, as part of the scientific color maps package. I also recommend uh, read some uh, very excellent online blog posts by Lisa Charlotte Muth um, on colors for data visualization. And she's an actual expert on this. And then if you want to know more on color, I give uh, entire lectures like this one here, just about color. Um, another important topic related to color is color gradients. And we use them a lot in data visualization, just when we do color mapping. So I will uh, highlight this now a little bit. Uh, but first we need to understand what color mapping actually is. So if you have a 3D graph with uh, representing three dimensions, X, Y, and Z, um, we can uh, make this much simpler uh, to present by just using a color bar. So if you turn um, the third dimension from a, a represented in position to a representation in color, we can actually squeeze the entire plot to a 2D surface, which is useful because we often present um, these data sets on a flat canvas, like a screen or in a paper. But now we have to be careful um, with the properties. So the color here represents the same as the space does in the axis on the left-hand side. And um, it's no surprise that there are really bad color maps. They're factually bad. It's not just my opinion. Um, like the rainbow, which is um, one of the most used color maps during, uh, for in research general. Um, it fails because it represents um, a change in, in data uh, differently along the color bar. So for example, a change between one and two should look the same as a change between uh, around six and seven, but it doesn't. So there's a huge difference and misrepresentation. And it's not surprising that most people see, you know, their features at the boundary between yellow and red. To make that even more clear, you can actually represent it as a position axis. And this is the exact representation of it. You have, um, you know, squeeze the space instead of the color here. And um, I think it becomes clear to every scientist that you wouldn't be able to even think about publishing uh, a graph with an axis like this. But for some reason, the color uh, map that is faulted is, is still often accepted even for publications. Um, luckily, um, uh, some clever people found out how to create perceptionally uniform gradients. This is what we need. We need even color gradients all along um, the entire gradient. Um, so people have developed this uh, perceptional uniform color space. Uh, one is called CCOM02 UCS. It's very complicated and a lot of research has gone into this. But what you need to know is that we can extract a color difference metric called delta E which basically gives um, the personal uh, difference between two individual colors. So how we perceive the change in two individual colors. So this is very useful because now we can actually quantify um, the change in color along a color gradient. And we can also develop actual good ones. So on the left hand side, you see bed low, um, where the graph is flat as it should be. So the change uh, between neighboring colors doesn't vary along the color bar. Whereas for chat, for the rainbow color map, it varies a lot. So this is a bad one. And now you can actually even quantify, quantify, that's not my opinion again, the error um, this introduces to your data set. And this is negligible for Betlow, but can be more than 8% of the data range shown with the color um, map. Um, to your data. So this is likely the, mo the biggest error in your data set. Uh, and it can easily be, you know, corrected by just using a proper color map. Um, to further highlight 
what you do to your data if you use a bad color map. Um, we can now quantify also the representation of a flat slope. So if you represent a flat slope with bad low, it remains flat. If you represent a flat slope with jet, it starts to be wobbly and you wouldn't have an idea that it initially that it actually is flat. So luckily, there's some good, factually good color maps. Uh, for example, the scientific color maps version 7 that you see here. Um, they're all perceptionally uniform and don't distort your data visually. They are perceptionally ordered, very intuitive to read. They're color vision deficiency friendly um, and don't exclude your, some of your readership. Um, they're even readable in black and white. Um, what's more, all of these um, color maps, they, they have different types uh, that we need to use for different data sets. And with the scientific color maps, all of these different types and classes are provided. So you also have continuous ones, you have discrete ones, and you have even categorical ones. Um, they are compatible, compatible with uh, all major software packages. They're now provided in more than 20 different formats. Uh, they are versioned and citable. Uh, which acknowledge the work that went into them, and uh, they are free to use. So they are really the scientific choice here. And you can find them on my web page. So uh, let's have a quick breather, uh, because there was already quite a lot of um, information in quite a short time. But so we've seen a lot of visualization tools, ranging from images, typefaces, graphs, graph scales, graph axis, the reference frame, and color. Um, but there's one more thing, one more tool I haven't mentioned, and it's quite an important one. And it's actually here. And it's also here. It's empty space. And empty space is, is super critical and useful. Um, it's used to make the figure more clear, and in some cases, even convey information. So it's really extremely powerful, really. <laughs> Can you see how important this really looks like? It's just because of the empty space. Um, here's an actual figure um, where I used empty space to convey some information. Um, for example, politicians are profiled with an elaborate profile. Athletes have an elaborate profile to understand them. Academics have one single number that ranks them. This number is even flawed and biased and unfair. So here I show this by having a lot of uh, empty space around it and this single number in the middle. So this empty space really highlights um, the number. Even though it's small, it kind of pops out more. So these were all the tools you need to know. Now we want to make a good figure. Um, I tried to give you a recipe here. Um, I would always start by knowing uh, what your message is, know what your audience is, and knowing what the figure's environment is. Um, then you have, a, you have created a first draft of a figure, for example, this one here. Then a good way to to continue is to perform the highway billboard test. So you just imagine your graphic on a highway billboard and the people driving by looking at it have around 10 seconds to, to get your main message and not more. And this already helps you to design your figure uh, in a better way. So this would be a better example here. But now how to make this better example? And, and there is where really the graphic design principles come in. So it's good to know all the, these different design principles. Uh, for example, there is contrast, there is symmetry or asymmetry, there is a graphic hierarchy, continuity and accessibility. And now we quickly go through all of them um, and have a look at them with some examples as well. So contrast, this is a figure that uses uh, contrast in quite a nice way in different um, uh, ways. So just by having a light gray color in the back, you basically give the context of it. It's the earth, a map of the earth. 
surface. Um, and then you have these high contrast blue blobs that contrast not only the, the more complex shape in the background, with some simple roundish shape, but they also contrast the entire figure with, with a, uh, a color that helps uh, the most important part to pop out most. Then symmetry is used to make the figure much more friendly to look at often. Um, you can also use asymmetry in some cases. So this is an example showing all the major elements of the Earth's mantle. Um, the areas represent the actual amount um, of these elements, but they are also arranged in a way that makes it pleasant to look at. So it finally it makes your figure also more effective. Then we have hierarchy. This is a very important one. So this is a super complicated figure and often you would say this is already too much, but if you put in some hierarchy and guide the viewer's eye, then uh, you can make it work. So first you will probably look at geodynamic modeling so you know what it's all about. And then your eye would be guided to the, to the arrow that goes from nature to scientific progress and the white bars on top of it. And then once you, you got all this, you go to the gray text uh, to get more in-depth information. So if you do this, you can make even complicated figures uh, work kind of effectively. Then continuity is also a nice one. Um, here is a figure with three different panels, but we have a continuity throughout the entire figure. So we have, first of all, the same um, typeface across this figure. Um, then we have the same coloring across this figure, and we have the same shapes across this figure. So um, it, just by continuity, you know that a horizontal bar, for example, on the left top, um, represents an, an oceanic plate. Um, this is just because you have similar shapes throughout this figure. And then we also have um, a gradient in color, uh, which represents the timing. So we go from light gray to dark gray, and this is also uh, applic applicable to all the three different panels. Um, the same goes with the fold, um, which is colored in, in pinkish colors. Um, that also gives you, um, on the first sight, um, an idea where how the system moves and where the important bits are. And finally, uh, accessibility. Of course, you need to make sure people can see and understand and access the information. Um, this is a periodic table of elements, but also now in uh, scientific coloring um, that, that is color vision deficiency friendly. So you can actually know um, which elements are in gas form and which are liquid form, for example. And um, some people might find it hard to read this, um, um, this typeface. Uh, so we on sync.org, uh, where we provide this figure, we also provide a figure that has a, a more friendly um, typeface, which is a uh, health ethica in this case. So it's also important to think about, yeah, is the figure accessible or not? Now I've showed you how to make a good figure. Now, of course, we all want to make a great figure as well. Um, and there, the only tip I can give you is really to, to put in the work and iterate obsessively. So if you have a final figure, um, do another round of improvements, uh, another round, yet another round, then submit your figure and maybe resubmit it again. Because only then you will really have a figure that, that is really great and you like. Once you have one of these great figures, um, please consider sharing it as well. Uh, for example, on, on the new graphics uh, platform, uh, it's called sync.org. Um, it's a pun on from source to ink. And it's, it's uh, geoscience related. So it has a lot of figures that are commonly used throughout our uh, discipline. And um, you can upload your own figures uh, you can clarify the licensing of the graphics, uh, make them citable by um, uploading in, 
to some repo repositories like Zenodo and to make them more widely useful by providing not just one figure, but um, alternations of it as well. And finally, of course, um, they can be easily findable then if they're all in the same place. So this is just a quick overview over the sync.org platform. It has a powerful search engine, um, some keywords. You can find um, some common graphics there. Um, then you can also contribute, of course, your own graphics that are reviewed by uh, an expert team, but also by the entire scientific community. You can comment on all the figures. And it gives you some, some important guidelines on how to create graphics. And yeah, finally, a, guide, uh, a gal gallery where you can look for figures if you need some. So, I just have uh, time to kind of summarize, and I will do this with uh, going through making a great poster or should have been a display this year because each year's General Assembly will have displays this year. But we will focus on the poster. So, if you make a poster design, first of all, we need to understand what's a poster. And the poster is a quick and concise view um, of your research. Um, quick and concise, so it's not meant to be uh, copy-pasted text from your paper onto a, a sheet of paper. And then again, remember, we design for a purpose. Um, we need to know our message. So for example, we found this and that. And really, uh, it helps me to really write those three things down before I start to create figures because otherwise I, I just don't think about it and then my figure isn't effective enough. Then know your audience. This, for the General Assembly, this would be a broad range of geoscientists, which means experts and non-experts of your particular field. And know the figure's environment, which would be a poster board in old days, and maybe also future days, uh, in a big poster hall. And for this, there's actually a super nice design um, which is called the Better Poster. And it's designed by Mike Morrison. And on sync.org, you find uh, a template for PowerPoint and Keynote. And it looks like this. Um, it uses a clear font that is easy to read. It has simple elements. So it has this main plate with the main, uh, main message in the middle, uh, which is separated uh, on the sides. Um, it has small text boxes or figure boxes. It has empty space. And again, there's a division into macro empty space and micro empty space. So macro empty space is really to give emphasis to something and micro um, empty space is used to, to uh, group different elements. And then uh, it uses contrast. So uh, the middle panel really pops out with the main message from the more detailed uh, parts on the sides. And it has symmetry as well. It has hierarchy. Um, your, your eye is guided to the important bits. So when you walk past this poster, you, you know exactly what it's about, what the main finding is. And if you're more interested, you go in and read the title um, and all the details of the results. So it's an effective way to have a poster. And the best of it is that this kind of poster is created in a very short amount of time. So people always say they don't have enough time to make a nice poster, but it's not the case with this. And this is clearly one of the most effective ones you can make. So yeah, use it. So to conclude, um, remember that there are different flavors of figures and they all need different aspects to get right. Um, avoid visualization pitfalls, especially use proper scales. Um, use color bars with scientific color gradients. Um, do test your figures for accessibility. Uh, remind your peers if they don't and teach your students that it's, it's key to do that because we still have, we still don't teach um, geoscience students um, about graphic design. Then know your visualization tools. We've gone through a couple of them. 
uh, follow the billboard test and apply some graphic um, design principles. And then you will get towards a great figure, um, which you then can use or share on, on an online platform with the community, um, which would be great on sync.org. So um, thank you very much for, for listening until the very end. Um, just remember that visualization deserves all your full attention and um, good luck with creating the figures for the General Assembly and your research in general. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Fabio. Um, I guess one of the key takeaways there is not to use a uh, rainbow color map. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have some time for some questions. Um, before I jump into that, I just want to quickly say um, that EGU webinars are published a week after on um, our YouTube channel. So look, type into EGU into uh, YouTube. Uh, the link is also in the chat. Um, and this time next week, you'll be able to rewatch it and use it as a resource. Um, so just moving on to some of the questions. We've got quite a few, but we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, one is from Frank Swan, and it's, I think it's two questions in one. One, um, and I'm just rephrasing here, and it's basically, is it possible that graphic design can be too flashy, in fact it might be off-putting? And secondly, is there a way to ensure some posterity? For example, if you think back to graphic design in the 70s, isn't really seen as so attractive um, in the current era. Um, I don't know if you had any answers to that as well. Yeah, so the first part is really important because it, it, it really guides our eye. So if there's something uh, that attracts the eye strongly, like bright colors, um, then it becomes really a, a, a way to um, guide our eyes and, and this can be a problematic for data visualization if, if one part of the data is attracting the eye more than the other. Actually warm color do that more than cold color so it can be a bit of a problem if you use both um, warm and cold colors in one figure. Um, regarding the other part of the question <clears throat> um, I guess this then becomes more a, a discussion of, of um, decoration and, and what we personally feel about certain color combinations. <clears throat> and then it becomes less a question of, of science or scientific graphic design. But yeah, I mean, I don't know, just try to make all the nice figures, I guess, is, is very useful as well. Sure, it's, it's hard to predict how trends might change, but I guess the first step is always to make sure that whatever data you want to represent. Um, it's uh, using, for example, scientific color maps rather than ones based necessarily on uh, current aesthetic trends. There are a couple of questions asking about, um, asking for program rep recommendations. Um, do you have any for graphic design, um, in particular, any tools for 3D or 2D conceptual figures? Yeah, um, there are a couple, of course. First, we always highlight the open openly accessible ones. Um, um, good ones are, are GIMP, has a terrible name, but uh, it's useful. Um, then there is um, Inkscape, which is basically the open version of something like Adobe Illustrator. Um, then there are others. Um, I actually, until recently, I often used uh, Microsoft PowerPoint or Keynote to create graphics because it's super effic efficient to do that. Uh, if you just want to put together some shapes and text, um, of course, you cannot export them into uh, vector design graphics then. But so for many cases, this is, is enough. And then if you go towards data visualization, of course, then you go into all, you can code everything you, on your own using Python or MATLAB and so on, um, or use um, 3D graphic design programs. Um, like um, Visit or Paraview, 
if you have big three-dimensional data sets, they are super nice to use. Um, and then if you just do um, graphic design by hand, um, I, I really like the Affinity design uh, software, which you have to pay a bit, but it's quite cheap. And it's certainly cheaper than Adobe Illustrator. And yeah, apart from that, maybe also pen and paper. You can always digitize it afterwards. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, another question is asking, um, it's not possible to know what level of color blindness someone might have. Um, so it's asking, how do we go about choosing uh, the color maps? And is there one that can best used to accommodate the most people or not? Yeah. So all the scientific color maps that I showed you, they're readable by all people because they're readable in grayscale. So the simple, simplest test to do is just look whether they are readable in grayscale. Um, this I've done. Um, all the scientific color maps, they have a lightness gradient, um, which makes them readable to all people. And if you're unsure about the color map that you find in your favorite software program, you can either yeah, convert it to grayscale or on the web, like there is some tools where you can check for colorblind simulations. Just Google colorblind simulation and you'll find a web page like Coblis that uh, provides you with the simulations of your figure by just uploading the figure. So, sure. yeah. so that's a simple test to make sure that it is readable is check it that check that it can be read in a grayscale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Another uh, question is asking for recommendations on courses, but if they want to dive a bit deeper, um, what resources can they go to to explore a bit further? Well, for the easiest way to do that, or the easiest, um, um, there's a lot of blog posts online. Um, of course, you don't always know whether the, re the resources is done by an expert but you can uh, get a lot of information by just following some graphic design experts and see um, whether they have published some blog posts. So there's a lot of this online. Um, other than that, yeah, contact graphic designers. Um, I also give presentations on, on for example, on color um, specifically. Um, yeah, just go to the experts, I guess. Yeah, find the experts find their content they're putting out there. So um, earlier in the presentation, you did recommend um, a few places to go. So um, next Wednesday when the recording is up and you want to look a bit further, um, feel free to browse this presentation at a more uh, leisurely pace for re uh, resources. One question that was sent in to me was asking about, um, are, are, do you have any thoughts on using colors uh, which champion sending a message over perhaps that's something scientific and can the two um work together i'm thinking in particular about the nasa well, i think it was nasa uh, the representation of ozone depletion in 1980s where areas of ozone depletion were represented with quite an angry red which conveyed i suppose more of an urgency uh, around the situation um is it is it possible that those two can uh, work together? The the need for to convey a message and keeping um, color design scientific. Yeah, um, definitely. I think um, that's one of the reason why I provide so many different scientific color maps that you can really choose colors that are most optimally representing your message and not just the data. So um, as long as you use a scientific color map that truly represents the data, you can choose the colors that highlight some parts um, more. For example, if you have a white background and you have a data set that goes from zero to 100 and you want to show the values in 100 um, are the most important ones, for example, danger level 100%, then you would use a color map going from some light color because it has a low contrast with the background to you know, some reddish color that really makes you think there is something there. So uh, you can definitely combine those two. 
a gate against back to those core principles of contrast and hierarchy for thinking how yeah. to push forward a message whilst keeping it scientific. Yeah. Um, uh, another question is, do you have suggestions for organizing multi-panel figures? Um, I guess because then the focus isn't just on the single image, but on multiple. Yeah. Yeah, I guess um, um, apply the same design principles, make sure there's continuity, um, represent, for example, the same data set with the same colors. It, that even applies throughout your entire paper, I would say. If you have a publication where you um, show CO2 throughout the paper, then always use the same colors for this um, variable. Um, yeah, continuity, use the same font, um, use the same um, symbols, and just make sure you don't overload the entire figure because when you have multiple panels, it can finally uh, be quite small when put on a, on a page, on a A4 page. Yeah, and otherwise just put them as single figures. Sure, thank you. Um, so we have time for one more question as time is quickly running out. Um, and that is, do you have a favorite published figure at all? Or anything <laughs> that perhaps you can recommend and people can look at for inspiration? Um, but yeah, I think, most figures on the sync.org platform uh, are really nice, so you should go look at them. But uh, if I had to pick one single figure, I would probably go with something like the warming stripes by a talkings, um, because they are so iconic. I don't know if you know them, but they, they basically represent the change in, in global mean temperature over the last couple of years, showing global warming quite dramatically and in a very simple way. So um, simple figures that have a, a, an important message are my favorite, I guess. Excellent. Um, and that uh, marks the end of the webinar. So let's see, thank you, Fabio, for a really informative and useful uh, presentation. It definitely got me reflecting on some of my uh, past attempts at visualization. Uh, thank you for everyone who joined and the questions put forth. Uh, as I said before, all EG webinars are uploaded to our YouTube channel uh, a week later. So if you want to come back to this as a resource, uh, keep an eye out. Otherwise, uh, thanks a lot, and I'll see you on the next webinar. Bye-bye.